I didn't want to think about motherhood until I found the partner. And then once I did, I, I also didn't believe in any of these kind of like, oh, um, you know, you know, mature, like 35 is geriatric pregnant. I laughed at that. Yeah. I also was really, you know, taken aback. Like I said, I'm in Hollywood. So you're always seeing some celebrity getting pregnant yes. at like 50 yeah. or like. Well, Haley, thank you so much. Welcome to Quiet the Clock. I'm so incredibly excited to have you here and have this conversation. Um, and we were just talking off camera about a mutual connection, Allison, who connected me with you. And that's what's been the beauty of this podcast and this journey is that everyone is really passionate about paying it forward and sharing their stories. And so anyone I speak to knows somebody else that has gone through this and says, you have to speak to this person. And so I appreciate the shared passion for this. I, oh. I appreciate your willingness to be here. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really, uh, I love Allison so much and, um, and I'm really happy to be here. I have to admit something to you. Tell me, tell me. I, it was so, I was so thrilled to be on this podcast. And then as I was like watching a lot, a couple of episodes to like prepare for yeah. our meetup, it was hard for me. To tell watch, me. yeah, yeah. yeah tell I me. was like, oh wow, I I don't know if I want to hear this person's journey again because it was bringing back a lot of things, and I had thought like I was so surprised about it because, as you know, I'm doing a full show about my experience yeah, as a when comedy you're all special about it, yeah, yeah, and I was really surprised to feel like um, I could only. Like, I would just come in a little bit here. I could see how warm you were and, and how friendly and how inviting you Aww. were. And I was like, great. I feel I'm going to be comfortable with this woman. We're going to have a great bond and connection. That's all I need to know. But, like, staying for the actual story was, like, a, I didn't, I don't know if I was ready for it. it, it it's interesting because um, I, I wonder, in, in terms of your audience base, if, like, are, are people it was just a curiosity yeah, me, like yeah. to see if people who are about to begin the journey find it really helpful or people who have gotten su successful in the things that they were pursuing also like to hear about it or or people in my case where you've tried so many different angles and things and it didn't necessarily work out the way you wanted do they still tune into these things? Like it was just, it was. Yeah, no. And I love you sharing sort of your response to it and your reaction. It sounds like a little bit surprised maybe to have that, but I think that's so honest and real yeah. and raw because I think, and that's, I think the nuance we're trying to figure out is because, and I think it's very normal to watch other people's journeys and be happy for them as if it's successful, but also then be sad for yourself. And, and, normalizing that it's okay to hold space for both. Yes. Um, I think it could be really hard to watch if it wasn't, it didn't turn out the way that you wanted. I think a lot of our audience are women that um, are thinking about egg freezing, are, right. are, you know, have questions they want answered or are unsure about it. And I think that it is helpful to hear other people's stories and just learn more about how, what was the medication? What was the process? Right. Where did you go? Um, but I think you bring up a really great point that's totally valid that, you know, can be hard to listen to. And I do know people that it's hard to listen to. I know for me, it was, it's been hard in my own journey to watch other people be successful and I not be successful. Yeah. So I think, yeah, there's is so much truth to just navigating all those emotions and like allowing yourself to feel them. Yeah. And it's so tricky, too, because, you know, you come into these things for information to learn, but then you you can't help but start to do comparison, which is so totally. not what you're supposed to do. You're yeah. like you have to recognize that you're a different person. You're not you know, your journey is different, your body chemistry and makeup. But then but then you have you also want to get the information. You also want to hear what people have gone through so you can navigate yeah. better. And it's such a tricky thing to like, to get in that, but then not compare yourself or like, well, well what did I do wrong? Oh that my gosh. Didn't, yeah. Like, work out. Like, I followed what this lady did and yet it's not. And it was it a successful for yeah. her or not. And I think that shows up. I mean, I'll speak for myself, like comparison has showed up so much for me and that's yeah. the biggest piece that I have struggled with. So whether it was like, 
you know, I wanted a baby and I didn't have one yet. And I saw everybody else get pregnant. Like that would like, you know, throw me off the rails, right? Like, I, you know, or then I have my son and I feel very grateful. And then I see people getting pregnant with their second and I want a second and that yes. would like throw me off. And I just think it's part of it. I yeah. think that that's the honesty to it is you're going to get in those places. You are going to compare, but then it's like, how do you move through those and yes. how do you move past those? And I think to deny those is like invalidating our feelings because it's real and it's what we feel. Absolutely. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. So I, I love you sharing that. I do. I love that honesty. <laughs> yeah. So it, let's Thank start you. with your journey. If you don't mind sharing here. Let's start with my journey. Um, if you can, I'm clearly a performer, comedian person because I might be doing a lot of weird little voices or sounds. <laughs> I love your vibe. And it's the end. It's like your last recording of this trip. And so like, it's like very comfortable and easy. So this okay. is great. Um, yeah. So I, because I've been um, like my, all my, my whole life, I knew that that's what I wanted to be was an entertainer. Mm -hmm. And it was just so clear that that was my purpose that, um, uh, motherhood and even marriage was like very back burner kind mm -hmm. of situation. And I also knew because I, I, I grew up in a two parent household and I could see very clearly that that's kind of what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, if that was possible, I would like to have a partner with it because it already seemed like a lot just in general. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, and what surprised me was once I got married, um, which that is another thing in all of itself. I even make a joke about it in my show that I got more congratulations and well wishes for getting married than any of my personal or professional Isn't achievements. That wild? Yeah. That's so wild. Like people were just like, oh, well, you've that, really done yeah. it. Well, well, that's part of the thing. And that's what we talk about is like that is deemed the milestone. That is yes. deemed the ac accomplishment. And then all the feelings of shame and unjudgment and all these things when you don't reach the milestones. That's why it's called Quiet the Clock. It's not only about fertility right. it's about like everybody gets to those things on their own time and that is not the marker of success whether or not you're married i'm not married i'm not married so i guess yeah. I, I haven't met that you know successful milestone yet but i but it's so also so arbitrary because it's like you can do things as a person that you've put a lot of effort and you're working towards. And then marriage really, which can like, which means that you have to like engage another person to like decide. And it's a lot of factors to make that right. Is like, uh, you know, you should be getting more achievements for these things that you have worked yourself for versus something that may or may not work out or like that has another person as a factor. Do you yeah, know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, and just because you're married doesn't mean it's successful. No, and it's also <laughs> so common. Not to be a jerk about it. I mean, I'm married too, right? But it's like... A lot of people get married. Like, <laughs> not everybody's doing a fertility podcast like you. Not everybody's like, oh, these are the things, like, yeah. we need to, like, celebrate. Yeah. Like, that is, like, something very new. I love that, yeah. Yeah, and, like, so it's like, oh, my gosh, the thing that is the most common on the planet, which is partnering in this way, whether it be good, bad, terrible, whatever, that's what's celebrated. It's like anybody can do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and sometimes people do it for the wrong reasons and all that, but you're still getting celebrated regardless. Yes, yes. And it was so frustrating for me, and I actually did like uh like a kind of improvised comedy show about it because I was so surprised and we didn't rush to get have children um because we wanted to travel and honestly on our honeymoon like we went to like three different continents like we wow where'd we, you go we went well actually two continents we went to um we went to we went from New Orleans to Paris oh us to then um, to Madrid, Spain, and then we bopped around several cities in Mor Morocco. Amazing. Um, and then I was, I, I thought it was, we also went to the Philippines, but it was not on that trip. But so that's why I thought it was like different. Mm -hmm. We went to Asia, but it, not true. Um, but yeah, so we were like, let's like enjoy each other because mm -hmm. we also found each other in a, a, like in our 30s and late 30s for me. And I, wanted to just like 
enjoy, enjoy it. it. Yeah. You know, this is also the first person I'd ever lived with. He, this is the first person he'd ever lived with. So we wanted to like get to know each yeah. other. Um, Before you had gotten married and were you feeling any of the narratives, a lot of narratives that come up and things that we talk about here is like the running out of time or feeling a certain way about not meeting someone yet or did none of that come up with you for you? I always felt like I was running out of time with my career. It okay. was always like, oh my gosh, I'm not the the latest young thing anymore. The big credit that, that was a big deal for me now is like 10 years old now. Nobody cares that you were did that project. Mm -hmm. You don't have another, like it was all, I've always had that. And because I live in LA, I w would often find myself like, seeing a kind of marker of like, oh, this person was doing this and then now they have their own show mm. and then they're doing this. And so that was always the thing that for me was like a, a litmus test of gotcha. milestones. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, nobody really thought I would ever find somebody. So no one was like coming up to me like, you need to freeze your eggs. Would you think about it? Because they were just like, this lady doesn't, is not doesn't seem like dating is her like she's so well, maybe yeah career focus i guess yeah. they realized that that was your priority and i also think in my mind when i looked at comedians and women who were in entertainment i saw you know i'm i saw that there was almost like a weird sacrifice mm. about the relationship because with men in entertainment, there's always like that silent woman in the background that's providing all their children and creating the fun photo op for them. And they, you mm. know, and and they go out and travel and then the lady is in the background. Holding it all and down. Then, right, holding yeah. it all down until they get exchanged for a younger model that can give them more children uh, in their later age, mm. you know, and who's tiny and young and whatever it is. And so with the women, I never saw that, you know, yeah. they were either single or having to cycle through. So I was just like, I guess. Which I'm is too frustrating in itself. <laughs> oh, yes, it is, lady. <laughs> oh, my God. So I was like, well, I mean, I'm clearly not the type that's like a wife. So um, but then when I found someone that really hit all the things that I wanted, mm. which was like someone who's going to be supportive of my career, somebody who um, who I think of as like a trusted friend, uh, someone who is interested in being with my family and I'm with them because I'm very close to my parents mm -hmm. and. And um, someone who also can get along with my friendship circle and has the same interests. I was like, oh, snap, this actually is cool. And it actually made me feel like I could take on motherhood because I was like, OK, I yeah. have support. Yeah. Because every person that I had told to talk to who was married were like, even if you have the best husband in the world, it's still on you as the lady. Yeah. The mm -hmm. children come to you. You could have the most supportive husband. You still bury the carry the brunt of it's it. It's true. It is true. It is true. Like, and and I, you know, Rob is an amazing father. He is so helpful. But yeah, we just there's so much that we do, like even behind the scenes, like the dentist appointments, the the diapers, make sure there's diapers, make sure. Yes, yeah, so there it, it it is. Even yeah, I I couldn't agree more with that sentiment. You can have the best husband, partner, father, but moms do a big load of it. They do. I mean, Jimmy Kimmel has this um, like little bit where he interviews like dads and on the street and he's like, give me all your kids age and ages. And he, he they're like, um, <laughs> do you know your child's like first grade teacher? Oh, no way. And they yeah. and then like they'll they'll ask the mom the same question and she'll be like, this boom, is the boom, boom, boom. 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 Yeah. 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 I mean, I think hope, I, I think we're getting generationally like men having a, like realizing that they need to like be more take apart. some of the load Look. yes yes but but that does to, to happen but um so yeah so the long story short of it is I didn't want to think about motherhood until I found the partner and then once I did I I also didn't believe in any of these kind of like oh um you know you know mature like 35 is geriatric pregnant I laughed at that yeah. I also was really you know taken aback like I said I'm in Hollywood so you're always seeing some celebrity getting pregnant yes. at like 50 yes. or like 49 it's so misleading it's so misleading so I was like oh great all I need you to do is save up that money for IVF get whatever the celebrities are doing and yep. then I get my um, own baby yeah yeah and it's it's and that was such a huge 
awakening that that's that's not how it works. Yeah, we had a guest on talking about that sort of the harmfulness of the celebrity narrative where you do see all those things. And of course, they're in like, you know, social media or or press, whatever, and you just... And I think sometimes certain celebrities, there's this lack of transparency of how they got there, Facts. which is also so harmful because you just, it creates this narrative that it can just happen. Look, Correct. oh my God, she got pregnant at 45 or she got pregnant at 47. And, and so it's so misleading and it's so harmful. And, you know, everybody has a right to their story and how they want to tell it. But I think some more transparency would be really helpful to a larger audience. Absolutely. Absolutely. But there's also with the transparency, you know, there's a lot of bias and there's a lot of um, hierarchy in terms of motherhood, like getting pregnant naturally versus getting pregnant with IVF Mm -hmm. versus your donor eggs versus natural pregnancy, giving birth without any meds versus doing an epidural versus like a season. Like, I know it's breastfeed, like, not breastfeed. Not, it, it's like, why are we just supporting every each other instead of judging like everybody's path and journey? Right. You're an adopted mom. Are you like, a, like, like it's, it's not as you haven't gone through the trenches as we have as a person who carried it's a, oh, it's a, a surrogate, yeah. uh, 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 using a surrogate and not, although I will say, and maybe I am now, I'm just like, we shouldn't judge. And then I have gotten really judgy. (laughs) But but it is weird to see so many, like, celebrity moms using uh, uh, surrogates. surrogates. It feels very Handmaid's Tale, you know what I mean? And uh, I always wonder about that because it's like, can you really not carry your own baby or you just don't want to? Yeah, I want to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was thinking about that, too. Like, I I was like, um, we can get into this, but, like, for my husband, um, I'll just call him uh, Mel. He he really was like, um, you know, because uh, I, I I was I think I'd be open. I was definitely open to adoption, fostering. I mm-hmm. it didn't really I didn't necessarily feel like I had to carry. I would want to, of mm-hmm. course, uh, just on like the progenies passing on, what have you. But if it didn't feel like that would preclude me from like trying something else but for him the, there was a part of him that really wanted to connect con- continue his genetic material and the what was my point of the story oh uh i was thinking like the older i got i was like i don't know if i even want to even if we had donor eggs that were beautiful and pristine and we made all these embryos it's like oh, do I really want to, like, you know, carry a child at 48 or 49 or 50? Like, Mm -hmm. what is Janet Jackson thinking? I was just thinking of Janet Jackson (laughs) as you're saying that. Like, uh, uh, what? I mean, just do your concert, lady. Why do you need to carry this baby? Go ahead and buy, oh, my God, that's terrible. But go get a surrogate. (laughs) But I think that's our choice as women. I know it is. Yeah, no, I'm not saying we're judging. I knew I was judging. I know, now we're judging. Now we're judging. (laughs) But yeah, I, but I think I think part of that is like, what is right for us, that right? What is right for us? Not based on what anyone else is saying, not what anyone is judging, not the way anyone else did it. Like, what is right for us, and what is right for your relationship, for you and your husband? What is that vision? And how, like, we can't pay attention to what other people are doing or what other people are saying that we should do. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's it's true, and you know. And I realized that even though I had said that little judgment about Janet Jackson, I I was also getting that same kind of judgment pursuing IVF in my 40s. You know, like, like maybe you should you missed the window. Mm-hmm. So let it go. Like, why are you spending all this money to try to to make to to what is it, uh, to to uh, quiet the clock, quiet the clock. <laughs> <laughs> or stop the clock or what have you. And then it's also such a misnomer because IVF doesn't stop the clock. It, you're still having to deal with what you what you have. And um, so, yeah, it go, Janet, do your thing. <laughs> there's no judgment. I'm glad you're. You, yeah. I mean, this is like I'm sure there's a part of her who wanted to experience what yeah, that was. So, yeah. Yeah. And if you can and you are able to, yeah. then why not? Sure. Yeah. So so you guys get married. And yeah. Do you start talking about children? Where does the journey start? Did you start trying naturally? Did you go right to IVF? Yes. So that's a great question, too. So as I said, like my career is in entertainment. It's, there's lots of highs, lows. And at the time that we got married, I was in a very big dry 
period in terms of work. That's got to be so hard. It is hard. Oh, I I gotta, yeah, to navigate that, like one minute things are going really well and then maybe not and kind of waiting out those, yeah, that's got to be really mentally, emotionally hard. It is mentally and emotionally hard. And you're living in Los Angeles, which is one of the most expensive cities in the world. Um, And we are conscious people that know that we want our child to be provided for. And it's so funny because like the older you get, the more conscious about it. Like, like I feel like a 16 year old is like, who cares? It'll, we'll figure it out. I'm yeah. pregnant. <laughs> then like, we're like, wait a second. What can we afford here? You know, this cost yeah. and childcare and yes. Yeah. Right. And we live in America that even though they are th- shoving down our throats that we should have our children um, on this kind of like, uh, feeling there's no support None, to really, have it. Yeah. Whether it's childcare or paid time off or having the partner having paid time off. Like I was listening, I don't know if it was Denmark or Sweden where they literally have a nurse come in for 10 days to and they get a year off and they get a year, a year off, off. Yeah. to be, to do housework, look at the other children, tell them how to latch, like let them sleep, wash yeah, we themselves. Are, we are so far behind. And yet we're, expecting that and um so so in 20 like a year into our marriage I got uh staffed which means I started writing on a show that I was also acting in and I had sold a television show and I was like 2019 and 2020 is gonna be amazing (laughs) so it's like start of 2020 we should just do this because everything is gonna go great in 2020 um it's gonna be a banner year (laughs) And, um, I think so many people thought that and, and then it was like, bam, not no, going to be a banner year. It was not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was not. <laughs> I was like, I had a mask on the other day because I felt something and I wanted to be, and I was like, I'm four years into this and every, I still have one in the car just in case. And I'm like, wow, who, who would have thought we really were like, we're going to do this for a month and then oh, and, and I think was, about sort of the psychological mental impact of that. I don't think we've all processed what we live through no we have not that's true yeah and so that's so that is when i started the fertility journey at the top at the very end of 2019 into 2020 oh my gosh yeah so did you have to stop at some point because things or did they let you continue treatments so i the first one thing that i I was so, um, I think, conditioned by what I would see with the celebrity things that I didn't. And I'm a person who does do a lot of research. I did not do enough research Mm. on IVF or even how much how I should have started to prepare my body for pregnancy in general. Well, I think that's really important to talk about, because even through just doing this podcast, I have learned so much more about other support resources, acupuncture, diet, nutrition and I mean, I froze my eggs at 37. I didn't know any of that stuff. And right. there's so much more. And this is what's so great about having these conversations and putting like good information out there is that there is, if you know about it, I mean, you can't do anything if you don't know about it, but if you know about it, there's other, other things that you can do. And I know that, you know, like we had acupuncturists on earlier and some medical doctors don't know some of these things. So it's on us to sort of seek that out and do that research. Yeah, it is. And it's kind of unfortunate because you're giving, you know, like I talk about it in my show, like it's like a $30,000 process and you actually have to do a lot of like startup stuff before you get there. And so much of diet and exercise and your mental state and, And so many homeopathic things can be done before you even get to whatever that level is. Yeah. And, you know, it's a it's a thing that sometimes I really do think about because you are going against the clock. And I was like, wow, if I had. What would have what would have. I can't do this. Like Mel was like, don't ever do this. Why are you doing this? But, but I'm like, if I had taken, if I had the, the real information at the start when I was younger, um, would I have had different results? Because my first doctor was very non-complimentary. He didn't really, he already felt my first IVF doctor 
I just got because he was on a plan that worked well with our insurance. This is not a thoughtful process, you know, like you need to really have someone who's like engaged and believes in you and is giving you different methods to try to do that. And he was very dogmatic about the drugs. And I'm also my body is not someone that is very um, like responsive to drugs and i i do very well with natural things Mm. and so he didn't he was very dismissive of that as a thing like as a who who kind of thing a a good amount are because they are not educated in those things and you know i'm sorry that was your experience and i had a similar experience where i was not supported i was not heard and it's so sensitive and so vulnerable that you really need that and I think this is why these conversations are so important because it gives you sort of the knowledge to know, just advocate for yourself. And if it doesn't feel right, you have to change it. So um, just to share a little bit about my journey, I did one round of IVF at this clinic that was just, I never met a doctor until the day of the transfer. And Mm. it was, I didn't feel supported. Wow. Yeah, it was so, so bad. And, you know, even doing this, being in this space and doing this podcast, there was so much I didn't know. And And I think- it's not. A, it's. A, it hasn't been ready, readily available to us. I think these conversations are good, and now people are sharing on social media, and you're doing your show. And I don't know if it's our f- fault that we didn't do enough research. I just don't think there was enough conversation around it. No, because there was so much. There's a lot of sh- guilt and shame about the process in general, and having to even do it, or having difficulties yes. about it, which is why you suffer kind of in silence, and. I will say this too, like as a black woman, I was really, and I talk about this in the show too, that um, I had been surrounded by so many people who had fibroids or Mm -hmm. um, like had really like serious kind of endometriosis, things that were happening that are directly related to racism in America. And, And I say America because they... It's it's not shown in like other uh, it doesn't show up in these cases in in Africa or in um, other parts uh, in where we see black mm-hmm. women. Mm-hmm. The, you see this pervasive in, in America. And so you're like, wow, not only is this man, this was a white male doctor. Not only is he disconnected from me mm-hmm. in terms of like understanding me as a f- woman He's not even understanding where I am on this journey of this. And he's also not even understanding even like a historical context of what what's happening here. Because modern gynecology stem from forced experiments done on enslaved black women. And like I learned this through doing my show, like these yeah. kinds of like historical things that are like wow. around. And it's like it's deep. And I was just like. I also feel like sometimes I'm like, wow, they really want to come to my show now. It's IVF. It is about um, enslavement. It is about <laughs> the, but I, I do think that the the reason why I wanted to do the show is like, I do want to talk about these things. And I've always, yes. as an entertainer, taken on subject matter that is challenging to talk about. And I think that is the role of the comedian to take on these topics and, and, and personalize them, give them, uh, and, and, uh, and allow for people to, uh, absorb them yeah. in a way that is, uh, speaks to their humanity um, more than like a textbook or some sort of like documentary, although there's We're no doing a documentary. documentary. <laughs> <laughs> but that's some sort of clinical documentary. About yeah, I, I think it's such a unique and amazing way to be cultivating these conversations. Yes. So I want to hear more about your journey, but then also, yeah, how the show was born, what you talk about on the show, what the response has been for the show. And I said this off camera, I'm so bummed because I'm leaving one day early. I would have been able to see your show. It's coming to you. I I feel (laughs) like you're going to get to see it. Um, well, yeah. So like I said, 2020, I thought was going to be my banner year for my career and my fertility. And none of those things happened. All, All those projects that I was telling you, they got shelved and it was really kind of tough. And I was having a hard time, like, um, getting work and getting pregnant. And um, one of the things that was kind of robbed for me in the pandemic was a uh, live performance. Mm. And so as soon as like it started opening up again, I thought, you know, I'd love to share like these struggles that I've been going through because 
what was happening to me was I was still getting asked because at this point I was like in my second year of marriage or third year of marriage. Like, when is the baby coming? Uh. When is the baby coming? And I didn't. And then I was also seeing people who got married around the same time as me. Becoming I know. How parents. is that for you? How is it for you to get those questions to see other people become parents or get pregnant? How, how, what was happening for you emotionally? Like, how did you take care of yourself? I wasn't. Um, I was in a really dark place and Mel was kind of really concerned for me because mm. not only was I not getting the creative outlet work wise, I was also not getting even the, the, the child, you know, the baby. Um, we were not. And so I did it as like a kind of like, um, yeah, like a, a lifesaver for myself. Mm. And I, 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 so normally with stand up comedians, you do like you work on your show bit by bit. Like you do like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then you keep working on that little bit and try it out at different clubs and then tighten it up. And then you add it to another part. And then if oh, you get your hour long, so that's how it usually wow. works. Yeah. And then, then you t tour with that. And then you learn a little bit more and then you're ready for the special and then you lock it in and it's for posterity. But with my show, I could not do little 10 minute bits, 10 minute bits here. So what I ended up doing was I was talking to my really good friend, the one who had actually produced that um, uh, improvised stand up show that I did about getting married. Just oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, um, I talked to her about some of the trouble that I was going to. And I was like, I, I don't know, but I'd love to just like do something with this if. Um, and she was like, oh, I want to support you in this. And she's like my now producer on this project. Mm -hmm. And I rented a little black box theater near my house. And I invited some of my closest friends. And I just actually literally just talked to them about what I was going really? through. Really? There were no jokes. I kind of cried. Of course. Halfway through yeah. it. And they were like, they, and, and this sounds so weird, like, this is a show. But like later they did say that mostly because they're like, this is important. We we really felt privileged to be let in on what's happening. And I still mm. get emotional thinking about it because, mm. you know, to, to, to sit there and to feel like you can like just let it all out and know that you're a performer. So like, I'm, I'm going to give you... I'm going to give you something like performative. I mean, I went to like theater school. So it's like, it's not just me like venting on a couch, like, like here, but I'm, it's going to feel a little bit theatrical, but it was really raw, you know? Oh, I bet. I can say it's already it's yeah. up now. Yeah. Yeah. And then. Was that healing for you to do that, to have that response to. You know, what was healing was, um. I'm always so surprised how emotional I get about it. I'm like, are you a crier because you're an actress or are you a crier because you're always feeling em emotions? Yeah. But what was so, the thing that healed me was not doing the show was the Q and A or like the discussion afterwards. Oh, tell me about that. Just hearing how much support I had in the audience and Allison was there. Oh. People also being because of my vulnerability, sharing their own vulnerability, um, the response and love that I got from men that were in the audience too, that it wasn't just like just a female story. It's a story about going for something that you really believe in and it not working out. And that's something that's really universal. Mm -hmm. And just like the support to like, just keep pursuing it. And just the belief in me as like a creative person to, 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 to be yeah. able to do it. And so then, then the next time I did it at that same theater, like a, a, maybe a month and a half later, I had a lot more jokes in it <laughs> and it was funny. And my, 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 my manager at the time, my like, uh, like, like was in the audience and he's like, he seemed excited about it. Ironically, he and him and his wife were going through a fertility struggle and, um, so many people are, yeah, so many people are. And I, I love what you said about that vulnerability invites vulnerability because once you start sharing your story, you hear a lot of stories back. It's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. And then, uh, and then it just became, then it was a, like a tighter show, but I was still doing the treatments as I was doing the show. And wow. that was really hard. And that was why 
for the first, the year that I was doing it, uh, um, I did the first show in 2022 and 2023 was, um, where, uh, 2022 was a, a, a lot of fertility treatments. And so was, uh, uh, 2023, but my friend and producer was very, cautious about how many shows I could do to take care of yourself. Yes. Yeah. So like how I was telling you about the stand up comedian who does like a bunch of shows, like maybe three or four shows a night to prepare for their yes. special. I could not do that with this show. No. Like I would have to do it and then take breaks. And, um, and so at the end of this year, I, I'm at a different level now with where I am with the fertility uh, we had a writer strike and an actor strike, and I'm a member of both unions. That also took a real hit for me. Oh my gosh! Yes, yeah. as, as well. And I just, I don't, I'm not gonna, I can't take out on. I don't think I'm, I'm not gonna take out another loan. I also feel like age wise, it feels like a little insane at this point. And so I thought I was like at the acceptance stage that my journey as a mother would look differently than me being able to. Con conceive naturally or through IVF. Do you mind me asking how many rounds you guys did? Yeah, I did seven rounds in four years. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. You know, ugh, women are such warriors. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And our capacity is expansive. And, and when you do want something, you will do your best to try. And I was at an event where they were talking about fertility and, you know, embryo transfers and all these things. And yeah. it was really powerful because a woman stood up and said, well, what do you say to the woman that did all the things and it didn't work? And we never really hear them because it's like, it seems like such a sad story. Like, Oh, so, so sad, but like, I know, and I'm crying. So it's like, do you really want to be daily? Um, maybe not. <laughs> You seem great. So well, that's why I'm also doing this show because it's like I'm a Buddhist and the the theme of the show is turning poison into medicine. And like the fact that I have been able to travel with the show, I started to reconnect with like friends from like undergrad at NYU Beautiful. that came to see me in New York do the show. And like now I'm like back in communication with them. I'm people that in the industry where, you know, it's about like connections and networking. It, this has been an effortless way for me to like reinvigorate those connections and people. Oh my people. gosh, and the conversations and the you're conversations. having. Oh my God. Like it's really actually, and it's been quite healing. And you know what? Tell me. Nobody asked me when I'm going to have a baby. Because <laughs> they know this show is out there. That was like a big benefit. I was like, oh, I get it. We don't have to ask her. We understand what's going on. So, yeah. So those those like weird, awkward conversations about what are you trying has completely stopped. So I was really uh, very <laughs> happily pleased. And you know what else was helpful with the show? Because I talk about some of the awkward things that people have said. It has now made them, and I've done it too. Like I've seen somebody get married. And I'm like, oh, you're gonna have a baby. You're gonna have another one. Like I've done that. Like yeah. I, I can talk about it because I've been that person. Is that people now? They're like, since I've watched your show, I'm, I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm more aware of like, like that I'm, you know, putting in my own like. Like I'm just making up conversation because I'm thinking this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. I think there's more because there's more conversation and vulnerability and openness. There's like we're we're teaching people sensitivity. Sensitivity. And, yeah. And thoughtfulness. And yeah, because I think those questions can fly around quite easily and you don't know what's gonna trigger yes. someone. Like so Rob and I are not married and those questions have stopped also, but we got that all the time. And like, yeah, I know we're not married. I don't know why we're not, you know, it's just like, it's, there's a new, I think more conversation creates more sensitivity. Yes, it's true. And I, and, um, and also the other beautiful benefit of it is like the show has, um, several friends of mine, thanks to the show, Allison, I yes, guess also yes. have gone ahead and f frozen their eggs or taken some efforts to, to do this or gone gleaned what, um, I've been saying and use that for their own fertility journey. So I feel like in some way I am a mother because some of them became mothers. And yeah. So, and you're paying it. You're paying, <laughs> paying it for it. it, it, it you're totally paying it for it. And yeah. I, I have to imagine like 
you're touching so many people in so many ways that you don't even realize. Mm -hmm. Like even if people are not at a stage to share their story, just hearing your story is helpful and and gives them something that maybe is like hopeful or reassuring or just relatable or normalizing. It's like, I just think it's so fantastic that you are doing this. And I saw one, a little clip you had sent. It was like the relax piece. And I'm just dying laughing because there's so much, just relax, just relax. Don't stress. It's like, this is the most stressful thing I will go through. And normalizing that and making it funny is a really great, unique way. To Thank do that. you. Thank you. I've been, it's been an interesting way to try to advertise the show because I know it can be tricky. Like we were just talking about me yeah. listening to some of your episodes and feeling like I didn't want to go listen to that. And I do sometimes get that from some people. Like I've gone through it. I don't know if I can like sit through a show to do that. And I'm not saying the show is just all. Um, l- l- laugh a minute, but I do, and uh, the whole journey of this doing the show also has been like, how do I end the show? Each time mm. I did the show, I had a new ending, like, because I, I wasn't sure how to end the show. Like, do, is it ending? Like, because this one woman I remember asking, she was like, does it end? Does it have a happy ending? And for her, the happy ending is like, at the end, I'd like, like show my pregnancy test or my ending. sonogram, and I'm like, there it is, you know, and so it was really interesting. And I and that's been also the cool part of watching this is like seeing that each time this iteration and I feel like now I have an ending that feels really mm. honest, real and like that can work like th- that that makes the most sense, because I think at the beginning of the show, because I felt like the show was going to help me get pregnant because I was like going to get all of my angst out and and just you don't want to have any toxicity in your body. You want to have your eggs feel good and vibrant and chill and relax. relax. So this is the, um, performing is my 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 happy place. So this is going to help all my eggs. And heal. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so that I remember my first show being like that, like this is going to solve everything. Oh. And then it felt weird and not. And it was also very hard to d- have that be the ending when you were getting non, not the f- the things that you wanted. But I was also like, what I'm doing is something that people need to understand how to navigate things not working out the way they want. But I've had so many great benefits from the show too. So how do we do an ending that acknowledges like, like, yes, it didn't maybe work out this way, but look at all this other stuff. Yeah. And I think it's like rewriting the narrative again, like we said earlier, the milestone of marriage being the success. I think it's rewriting the narrative that like the happy ending doesn't have to be the baby. There can be so many other happy endings to this. And I think we're just sort of programmed in this way to know one way is happy, one way is success. And we have to be more expansive than that. We have to open open our perspective to like, you know, it it can look many different ways and I could be happy with many different ways. And I think that's why things can be so disappointing when we're attached to this idea that one way is right, one way is happy, one way is successful. And if that's the model and our journey doesn't look like that, then how do we feel? Right. Right. And, And I think that's what's so important is like we need to talk about other outcomes. Yeah. And normalize other outcomes and share other outcomes. So well, so what is the ending of the show now? Well, I, I'm not going to, Shelly's coming, oh. so I can't give it to you. And I, I'm literally doing this so you can come and see it at some point. I know um, you're making me feel even worse than I said, see it. <laughs> no, no. I'll wait. I will wait. Well, I we will now wait. have to have it be like a, a very popular uh, thing that's on and everyone's television set so that you, everyone will see it. But, um, yes, yes, yes. No, I, 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 yeah, I'm I'm excited to see what Shelly thinks about this ending. I think this is going to be the ending, but who knows? Like, I might... Well, don't uh, share it. So sell, no, sell I'm not going to share it. Okay. But it might... It, it, whenever I go to a new city, somehow it informs me and the ending has, like, changed. But I feel like this is it. But um, also, can I admit something to you? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm like, do you want to talk? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I realize, too, like... I don't, I really love children and I love, like, I could totally see me and Mel being fantastic parents, but I also there, I had to acknowledge for myself that I still am very committed to my career and I don't know if, I, and I'm around because by virtue of my friendship circle where a lot of my friends were getting pregnant, weirdly 
in the same age range as me. And I was like, at first it was triggering, but then it was also very helpful because I could see in real time what it looks like. like. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I really love sleeping in late. I really that wouldn't happen. Yeah, that would not happen. I re- and I, you know, the 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 mommy shaming with the breastfeeding and and I'm not saying like being a mother is not worth it, but I was like, for me, is is that is that really De Haley's like dream to carry and give birth and and if it happened, I would 100 percent welcome it. But I, I don't know if I am actually necessarily missing that component. And if I can have motherhood in a different way where I am an adoptive mom or I do feel like I will still feel that connection and I don't necessarily have to um, carry or conceive it. I, I, I don't know. Sometimes I say this and then the next day I'm like, oh man, look at that lady. But I think that's, compl- I think that's, that's completely, I think that's completely normal. And just to, again, create space, hold space for all of it. All of it. Right. And not judging like, well, this day I thought that, and this day I think that, and what's Thank the right you. feeling? It's like, no, it's all relative. It's all real. It's all honest. And just giving ourselves permission to hold space for all of that is yes. just, it's so, so important. And I think those questions of like, what do we actually want is so important instead of what we're told to want yes. or what we're told the picture should look like. And again, if that's the picture that is right and it doesn't look that way, it's like we feel all these ways about ourselves. And I, so I think it's really admirable to like pause and say, what's right for me? What's right for my life? What is important to me? What is important for me and my family? What do I want my family to look like based on you? Totally based on you. Yeah. No, I really appreciate you saying that. I mean, I know you're a therapist as well. But, but I was like, thank you. I do need permission. Yes. I need to hold space. Yes. I need to, yeah, it's not a cookie cutter thing. I I, I have this joke in my show about like, um, uh, we want Rocky, if we want Rocky Road ice cream, don't you know, suggest that we get cookie dough. You know, we may go from shop to shop to shop until we get our rocky road. And sometimes people want you to just get cookie dough because mm. they're like, that's easier. It's right here. Just get that cookie dough. And it's like, this is what it is for me. Yeah. Um, um, so I, yeah. And this is like what I want. Um, like Taylor, make it have a bespoke child for myself that, that, that matches like our sensibilities and what yeah. we need. Yeah. Yeah. I know my, this is probably what, not one answer for this, but what feels really important for you to convey through the show? What feels really important for you to have people know and understand? Where do you think the conversation is lacking? Where do you think that we need to fill that gap and void? So t- three things. I love to number stuff. Okay. <laughs> I talk at the start of my show about how my biggest dream is to have a comedy special seen by millions. Like that has always been my yes. biggest dream before motherhood and everything. So the fact is I'm still pursuing that. And that means you should continue to pursue your dream, whatever that is. Mm. Um, the other thing is I did learn a lot of st- a lot from this process. And I do feel like um, being vulnerable is such a very helpful way um, sh- breaking down shame barriers. But we also talked about before the podcast that I, even though I am being so raw and vulnerable in this show and sharing a lot, I like, I like having this be a theatrical experience Mm -hmm. because you are deciding to go in on this journey with me by buying a ticket, sitting in the seat. And we are having a life to life connection of that, which, and I'm not judging anyone else who decides to do these vlogs on TikTok or YouTube, but I found those things to be very hard for me and a little bit harmful because it was a judgmental format where you're only being engaged in a comment where I was not getting a, a face to face. And I talked about Buddhism earlier, but I do think that that is where we are going in terms of the world is to have more life to life connections, yes. oh my gosh, more dialogue, yes. even though we have all these screens and things that keep us connected. We as human beings and as living creatures need to have connection that are from that, whether it be a flower, that's a living thing or like being out in nature, like we need to that to be restorative. And that's why the show mm-hmm. has been so important for me to have in this way. And that's why it's been important for me to tour it as much as I can now. Um, 
but I also know it's a show that I cannot tour for years and years and years. It has to be preserved because it is a hard show for me to do that, 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 that for accessibility reasons, I would like it to be done as a special so that people can access it when they want like to. Like Evergreen and yeah. And exactly. And for maybe that, I love that because for maybe the person that couldn't watch it now, mm -hmm. maybe a year from now. Yes, exactly. It. Yeah. Right. And, and I can also move on from that and not have this be my whole life touring the show for 10 yeah. years. Like, yeah. you know, Celine Dion has to sing the heart, my heart will go on at every <laughs> concert. And now, but I can now like, do another thing. Like Beyonce, you know, has to do her stuff every concert. But now as a performer, I can like try out something else and I don't have to be, be in this. So. Yeah. I, I think that's a really important point too, because I think, you know, when you're in this journey and I've been in this journey too, it's, it's, it can become such the focal point of your life mm -hmm. and brand you as this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just kind of maintaining some sense of self outside of this. Yes. It's so important. It's so important. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, so it's working on two things. It's like, I think it's an educational, um, uh, Peace. Um, I think I'm also really shedding light to black women's experiences in America, particularly yes. in ways that people haven't talked about. Even I also talk about like when we do get pregnant, we have the highest mortality rates um, because, you know, our pain isn't. Believed. Well, you, I was just going to say that, right? And when you were talking earlier about endometriosis and fibroids, like some doctors are not taking those things seriously. They're not. Or just assuming maybe it's fibroids when it's an endometriosis. So, yeah, just shedding light on those important conversations. Yeah. And and another thing is too, like I had a friend be like, oh, you need to talk about this or this and this. I'm not here to give the full um, uh, breadth and scope of a medical book on what every woman, I'm going, I'm purely doing it from my perspective. You had a, a black woman on earlier who was talking about how she was not getting many eggs in her yes, retrieval. Yes. And that was the one I was like, I'm going to tap out. Yeah. Um, and then I was also listening to one where you were speaking to like a, his, a, a, an Orthodox Jewish woman. Yes. And, and <laughs> she had a very different experience with how many, and she was much younger. She was yes. like in her twenties or something. So, I was just like, I'm realizing like everyone has a very different experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just because you may get a bunch of eggs in a retrieval, that doesn't always mean that they turn into. So I'm, I'm not interested in trying to be the catch all for every experience in, in anyone's life, but just present mine and allow you to see that yours is unique and, and yours is valid to, to have. Too. A thousand percent. I just think also the vulnerability of having a conversation period yeah is so huge and important so they yeah so i want to normalize yeah, it yeah, yeah. let's yes. normalize yes. this i mean really yeah and the vulnerability and willingness to just say hey here's my experience let's like shed some more light on this stuff this is why i'm doing this podcast too it's just i think it's so wonderful yeah I think it's so wonderful and thank you so it much. is going to be watched by millions i feel it you I wish, do? yeah i do oh. i do it's so important it's so thank you i just think it's it's amazing and incredible that you're you're out there and you're doing it and you're sharing your story i think it's just it's going to be so it's probably already been so helpful it's going to be so helpful i feel so grateful to be able to be on this couch with Me you too. I feel and really have grateful. have this conversation so thank you so much for being here and i am going to get to your show at some point i will find a way we'll figure it out <laughs> great i i thank you allison for bringing us together and and thank you i I'm, I'm i'm glad you're doing this and i know women have been here since the start of the like but yet our are the issues and the things that we've been going through have been like in a sh in the shadows and it's yes. time to bring it to Wrapped light under the rug yes we're bringing them to light yeah. yes. thank you so much for being here thank you Thanks. if you like the episodes that you're hearing and you want to hear more please subscribe to our channel and stay tuned for more incredible stories and tools when I froze my eggs at 37, I felt alone, I felt unsure, I felt confused and uncertain. And when you're considering such a big decision, feeling those ways do not feel good. So we have created a step-by-step -step guide to egg freezing so no one else has to feel that way. If you are considering egg freezing, if you're curious about what the process looks like or what you should be thinking about, then this guide is for you. We were really thoughtful in how we put it together. I think it's a great guide. I think it's really comprehensive and covers a lot of the things to be thinking about, to be considering, and maybe some things you didn't even realize you should be thinking about or considering. Um, the goal is to not let, have anyone feel alone in this journey. So if you, again, if you're thinking about this decision, 
Sign up through our website, quietetheclock.com, and make sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at quietetheclockpod. This is a very big decision, so I don't want anyone to feel alone in it. So if you're thinking about it, grab this guide, and you can also DM me with any questions. I'm here to support you through this decision and this journey.